Hello there, my name is Julian Humphreys. I'm a trustee of the Battlefields Trust, which is the UK charity dedicated to preserving and explaining Britain's historic battlefields. And in this short lecture, I'm going to take a brief look at that period of history that we call the Wars of the Roses. I should start by pointing out that it is wars, not war. There were, rather than one long period of fighting, there were actually three main conflicts. And as we'll see, each one had its own individual causes and results. I should also say that while we often think about, you know, the Red Rose of Lancaster against the White Rose of the House of York, uh, for much of the wars, although the Yorkists did actually employ a White Rose as one of their badges, the Lancastrians only used a red one at the very end of the period. And the other thing to say is it's not Lancashire versus Yorkshire. Um, the titles Lancaster and York were just titles. And for much of the wars, for example, um, York itself was Lancastrian. So in looking at the causes and the outbreak of the Wars of the Roses, I think we have to look to start with at the Lancastrian King Henry VI. Uh, here he is, son of the warrior King uh, Henry V. And my word, what a contrast he was to his father. Uh, Henry VI was no warrior. He was a scholar more than a soldier. And of course, it was in his reign that England was finally defeated in the Hundred Years' War. And I suppose that alongside winning battles, a big test of kingship at the time was the ability to keep your nobility on side and use them in a constructive way. And uh, Henry was really rather unable to do this. Um, he was prone to periods of mental collapse. And when he wasn't in one of those periods, he was very prone to falling under the influence of favourites. And, you know, you really needed to sort of divvy up the jobs amongst the nobility. And uh, if you had somebody that hoovered up, for example, all the offices the valuable offices and jobs, for example, or, you know, the marriages that were available at the time. It meant that there were plenty of other disgruntled nobles around. And in many ways, I suppose, the most important of these was this chap. This is Richard, the third Duke of York. He was the father of the future Edward IV and Richard III. And this little image of him, lovely little image, is in the Church of St. John the Baptist in Sirencester. Can you see that it's got the royal arms on the... Uh, um, on the window. And it's a reminder that actually Richard of York had a claim to the throne himself, as he was a great grandson of Edward III through both his father and his mother. And actually, you could argue that his claim to the throne was better than that of Henry VI's. But at the start of the wars, at least, he wasn't after the throne. He just wanted to ensure that he received the leading role in government that he believed he deserved. And of course, this was very important given the inadequacies of Henry VI as a ruler. Richard of York, as I say, he felt that he was being denied that. So there were stresses and strains at the very top of English society between the incompetent uh, Henry VI and the much more competent but disgruntled uh, Richard of York. And this tense situation was exacerbated, I think, by a series of rather bitter family rivalries. And perhaps the best example of this was the enmity between the Nevilles and the Percys. Now, the head of the Nevilles at the outbreak of the Wars of the Roses was the Earl of Salisbury. But perhaps the best known of the, of the Nevilles was the 16th Earl of Warwick. He was the man that has gone down in history as Warwick the Kingmaker. Now, he got huge amounts of land and wealth and indeed his title, Earl of Warwick, through his marriage as a child to Anne Beecham. And here he is actually on his father-in-law, Richard Beecham's tomb in St Mary's Church in Warwick. Now, the great rivals, as I say, of the Nevilles, particularly in the north of England, were the Percys. They were actually the most powerful family in the, in the north. They were often known as the kings of the north and their best known castles, which you may have visited, are at Annick and Walkworth. And they were sort of kingmakers themselves because they'd helped make Henry IV king and then indeed they'd rebelled against him. But the thing about them was that kings needed them. Um, you, you couldn't really do without them in the, in the north of England because they had so much influence up there that they had the power that was needed to sort of defend the border as best as possible against the Scots. So you had this Percy Neville enmity. You also had tensions between the Nevilles and the Beauforts. I should say, by the way, that none of this prevented these families from intermarrying. But there was this tension between the Beauforts and the Nevilles. And it was partly because uh, the Beaufort Duke of Somerset was a favourite of Henry VI. And it was partly because the Beauforts were challenging 
this great inheritance that the Earl of Warwick had got through his marriage to Anne Beecham. So I guess that it was perhaps inevitable that when tension spilled over into violence, the Percys and the Beauforts would choose one side, the Lancastrian side, and the Nevilles would back the Duke of York. Now, the first major outbreak of fighting in the Wars of the Roses took place in 1455 at St Albans. And you can see the aftermath of that in this brilliant painting by Graham Turner. I'm going to be using one or two of his other pictures later on in the, uh, in the talk here. Now, at the time, uh, Richard of York had been excluded from court. And so with Neville help, he decided to take matters into his own hands. And he actually attacked the royal court, which at the time was based at St Albans. Now, their objective doesn't seem to have been to attack Henry VI himself, but rather to kill their enemies. And indeed, kill them they did. So the Earl of Northumberland, a Percy, the Duke of Somerset, a Beaufort, um, and Lord Clifford, all enemies, incidentally, of the Nevilles, they were all slain. And it was the first act, in many ways, in a long story of revenge and reprisal that would be repeated later on in the wars. In this picture, incidentally, you can see on the left hand side the banner with the um, falcon and fetlock of the Duke of York and the bear and ragged staff, the red and white banner there of the Earl of Warwick. Now, after this brief period of bloodletting, things quietened down a bit for a while, but nothing had been solved. Um, Richard of York's position was in his eyes still insecure, dangerously insecure. And the sons of those Lancastrian nobles that had been killed at St Albans were thirsting for revenge. Anyway, in 1459, fighting broke out again. And in July 1460, uh, York defeated the Lancastrians at Northampton and he captured Henry VI. Here's another picture by Graham Turner. And note that the Yorkists are still treating Henry as their king. Note also the gun in the foreground. This is something we'll hear about at Bosworth. So Richard of York was in a much stronger position now, especially as he had control of Henry VI. But he then went and raised the stakes by actually claiming the throne. Now, I suppose he must have felt that while Henry VI was king, he'd never be fully secure from his enemies. But this was a step too far, even for many of his supporters. Thing was that Henry VI was the anointed king, answerable to God, and you didn't set aside an anointed king. So in the end, a compromise was worked out. Henry VI would remain king, but when he died, he'd be succeeded by Richard of York or Richard of York's descendants if Richard was dead. Now, this seemed reasonable to many people. It seemed to be an improvement of government without overthrowing the anointed king. But they hadn't reckoned with uh, Henry VI's wife, Margaret of Anjou. Now, somehow she and Henry VI had managed to produce an heir who was called Edward. And Margaret was not going to see her son disinherited. So she raised an army, predominantly of northerners. And in December 1460, this army defeated and killed Richard of York at Wakefield. One of Richard's sons, the Earl of Rutland, and the Neville Earl of Salisbury was also killed. And Margaret hammered home her triumph by having the heads of her dead enemies stuck on spikes on Micklegate Bar in York. Some say that she had a paper crown stuck on York's head to mock his aspirations to the throne. The Lancastrians followed up their victory by heading south to London and they swept aside the Earl of Warwick's attempt to stop them at the Second Battle of St Albans and then they recaptured Henry VI. But when they got to London, the city wouldn't let them in. It's believed that they were scared by accounts of the ravages and looting of what they saw as an army of savage northerners. So the Lancastrians had no option but to fall back to their heartland, the north. But by now, the Yorkists had a new leader, the Duke of York's son, Edward of March. He had proved his mettle by defeating a Lancastrian force at Mortimer's Cross near Ludlow, and he was now proclaimed King Edward IV by his supporters. Edward IV, as he was now known, gathered together an army, uh, predominantly from the south, the Midlands and East Anglia, and joined by Warwick, he headed north to confront the Lancastrians in what would be a winner-takes-all battle. Now that battle was fought in the snow at Towton in March 1461, and Edward emerged victorious. Some accounts claim that 28,000 men were killed at Towton. Well, that's almost certainly a huge exaggeration, but there's no doubt that it was a particularly bloody battle. And although Henry VI escaped the clutches of the Yorkists, it was a mortal blow to the Lancastrian cause. Actually, Lancastrian resistance still lingered on in the northeast, and the Nevilles would spend about three years stamping it out. 
Meanwhile, though, Edward had embarked on a campaign of his own, a battle for the hand of Elizabeth Woodville, a beautiful Lancastrian widow. Uh, this picture is in Queen's College, Cambridge, which she was a benefactress of. And in 1464, he married her in secret. Now, I think there's no doubt, well, to Edward at least, that uh, Elizabeth was a very desirable prize. But the problem was that she came with a large family and they needed then to be found offices and marriages. And this rather put the Earl of Warwick's nose out of joint. Prior to this, uh, the Nevilles had been bagging, you know, the good marriages and getting the good jobs. And I guess that Warwick would have said that as his family had been instrumental in helping Edward IV get to the throne in the first place, that was only right. Well, now Warwick was seeing his influence being eroded away by this family of parvenus, the Woodvilles. And for him, there was an added humiliation. For he announced to Edward IV in a meeting that he'd been negotiating a foreign marriage for the king, only for Edward to tell him that he was already married. The king hadn't even told him before that. Well, by 1469, Warwick had had enough. He rebelled against Edward and actually briefly held him prisoner, only to be forced by popular pressure to release him. Then, in 1470, after a second failed rebellion, he made an extraordinary alliance of convenience with his old enemy, Margaret of Anjou, the wife of Henry VI, and together they forced Edward IV into exile and restored poor Henry VI to the throne. By now, he was a shadow of a man, really, a pathetic figure, and it's probably like he didn't even know what was going on. So Warwick and Margaret had taken back control but Edward IV was not the kind of man to give up without a fight. And in 1471, he returned to England and with the help of his younger brother, Richard of Gloucester, we'll hear more about him later, he brought his enemies to battle separately. On 14th of April, 1471, he defeated and killed Warwick the Kingmaker and his brother, uh, Lord uh, Montague, in a very confused battle in the fog at Barnet. So Edward had broken the power of the Nevilles now it was time to deal with Margaret of Anjou and her son Edward. It didn't take long. On the 4th of May, Edward IV caught up with Margaret's army at Tewkesbury and absolutely destroyed it, and in the process killed her son, Edward, Prince of Wales. The Lancastrians had been crushed, really, and Edward finished the job by having poor old Henry VI done away with in the Tower of London. So, to all intents and purposes, Edward had won the Wars of the Roses and he would now reign unchallenged until his early death in 1483. Now, I think it's worth saying at this point that you shouldn't necessarily think of the followers of Edward IV as a united force. Yes, they would act together against a common foe, but they did have their own interest to forward and really they were mainly held together by their loyalty to Edward IV, their king. Not that they were all necessarily loyal. George, Duke of Clarence, Edward's brother, had proved himself somewhat unreliable, especially during Warwick's rebellion. And in the end, Edward lost patience with his political scheming and he had him executed in 1478. This is the guy, incidentally, that Shakespeare has being drowned in a butt of Malmsey wine. Then, of course, there were the Woodvilles. Well, they'd come from relatively low beginnings and um, they were very reliant upon Edward's patronage for their position at court. Now Edward and Elizabeth Woodville had a number of children and perhaps the most important ones for us would be Edward, the future Edward V, his brother Richard of York, they were the princes in the tower, and Elizabeth of York who would later marry Henry VII. Then you had William Hastings' faction, uh, very powerful in the East Midlands. He was Edward's friend and drinking partner. He shared his exile in 1470-1471. He was immensely loyal to Edward and I think his children, but he was no great friend of the Woodvilles. And then, of course, there was Richard of Gloucester, very loyal to his brother, Edward's reliable lieutenant in the north of England, where he built up a power block, very much with lands that formerly belonged to the Nevilles. Again, no friend to the Woodvilles. Anyway, while Edward IV was alive and he could bang a few heads together, all was fine. But when he unexpectedly died in 1483, the cracks began to show as these various interest groups began to jockey for position. And it was Richard of Gloucester who made the running. Firstly, getting the two princes out of the clutches of the Woodvilles and therefore securing his position as protector. Now, at this stage, there seems to be no hint of what was to come, and the princes were moved to the tower, ready for young Edward's coronation. Now, the tower's got this sort of black reputation, but it should be said that at this time, there was nothing sinister in this. Uh, the 
tower was the traditional place where monarchs did stay prior to their coronation. But then in June 1483, everything changed and it happened very quickly. Uh, on the 13th of June, there was a council meeting and Richard suddenly declared that there was a plot against him. And he had William Hastings pulled out of the meeting and beheaded. Um, why did he do this? Well, probably because it was to clear the way for what was going to happen next that I think he felt that uh, William Hastings wouldn't go along with. And that was that on the 22nd of June, a cleric named Ralph Shah preached a sermon that claimed that Edward IV's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville uh, was invalid because he'd been pre-contracted to another woman called Elizabeth Butler. And at that time, a pre-contract was the same as an actual marriage. That meant that young Edward and young Richard were illegitimate and Edward's claim to the throne and that of his brother, of course, was set aside. And instead of Edward V being crowned, it turned out to be Richard, who, of course, now became Richard III. Uh, now, these actions would fatally split the Yorkist establishment. Members of Edward's household owed no particular loyalty to Richard III. The Woodvilles were, of course, alienated. And Richard actually relied upon a rather narrow base of support, largely drawn from his followers in the north of England. Well, this allowed Henry Tudor, a relatively unknown exile with a very slight dynastic claim to the throne through his mother, Lady Margaret Beaufort, to position himself as champion of not just what was left of the House of Lancaster, but also of the House of York, a position he strengthened by promising to marry Edward IV's daughter, Elizabeth. In uh, October 1483, Richard was able to see off a rebellion in favour of Henry Tudor, known as Buckingham's Rebellion. It's interesting, actually, that many of the rebels were actually former members of Edward IV's household. And uh, the fact that they rebelled in favour of Tudor is surely evidence that if the princes weren't dead, they were certainly thought to be so. Now, I've mentioned that Richard was reliant very much on a relatively narrow power base of people, largely from the north. And actually, he further alienated the political nation, or at least people in the south, by granting confiscated rebel land um, to his northern supporters. Now, the upshot of all of this is that when in August 1485, Henry Tudor landed in Wales with a force of French mercenaries, uh, Lancastrian diehards and former supporters of Edward IV, um, though few nobles were prepared to risk life and property by actually joining the rebellion, few actively opposed it either. Even so, when Richard did take on Henry Tudor at Bosworth on the 22nd of August 1485, he did have the larger army. The only problem was that a number of his men do seem to have been rather reluctant to commit themselves. Richard was killed in the battle and Henry Tudor seized the throne and two years later he successfully defended it against a rebellion by Yorkist diehards at Stoke. So that's a very brief introduction to the Wars of the Roses. If it caused dissent and controversy then, well, it still does today, not least over the character of Richard III and the fate of the princes in the tower. But that's for somebody else to discuss. But if you'd like to know more about the battles and the events of the Wars of the Roses, why not check out the Resource Centre on the Battlefields Trust website at www.battlefieldstrust.com. There really is a huge amount of information there. Anyway, thanks very much for listening.